What's up, Internet? Welcome to Once Over. I'm Kaylee, and this is Carl, and today we're going to be giving the Once Over to One Too Many. I grow on people. Like a fungus. Can I say hi to the Internet, too? Yeah. Hi, Internet. This is Carl from Who Are These Podcasts? Don't tell them that. They know. I have a reputation. I think they already know. To protect? <laughs> there will be spoilers. Spoilers for one too many? Uh, spoiler alert, it's terrible. Do not watch. Waste of time. Thanks for having me, Kelly. Thank you for being here. Of course. I'm really excited to have you because I think there's probably not a lot of people who are more qualified to review with me one of the worst movies ever. And it pisses me off that I had this qualification because I've had to watch this movie like three or four times now against my will in order to either review it or do a talk track or whatever I've done with this movie, it's terrible. It's awful. So tell us a little bit about your qualifications. Well, I host two of these podcasts and we started making fun of Stutter and John and his Stutter and John podcast in I think 2017. And uh, since then I've goofed on him hundreds of times for different reasons. And we actually just recently had a very triumphant DabbleCon event here in Rochester. It was amazing. We spent a whole weekend goofing on John, and we even had a Dabby Award ceremony because uh, Stuttering John is the dabbler. He dabbles in comedy. So One Too Many came out in 2008, which was after Stuttering John's time on the Howard Stern Show. Correct. I think at the time he was doing The Tonight Show. He was. He was working on The Tonight Show because they did a segment about his premiere. You can actually pinpoint the second when his heart rips in half. Jay, there were plenty of stars there. Ross, just tell them. Come on. It was, it was a yeah. 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 So he's got connections in Hollywood at this point. He's working with Jay Leno. He has every big celebrity A-lister coming through on his job every day. So he should be able to make an awesome movie. An awesome movie is what we're contacts. expecting. Right. It's going to be great. Yeah. Um, but instead, we got Drivel, where Stuttering John plays Thomas, who is a guy who really wants to find a girlfriend who will allow him to have threesomes with other girls. That's pretty much the entire That's plot. the entire movie. Yes. Yeah. And I'm, am I to believe that he's banging every chick he runs into on the street, or is he just fantasizing about that? Yes. Yeah, so I, that's how the whole movie starts out. And, yeah. and also, yeah. how often do you fuck with your shirt on? Every chick in this movie fucks with her shirt on. It's like she wants to get out of there as quickly as possible. There were very few boobs. <laughs> yeah. I was really disappointed yeah, was with the amount of boobs. Excuse me! Not only does he star in it, but he's also the writer and the producer. Right. So he wrote his character based upon what I feel like is like this fantasy world of what he wants his life to be like. Correct. It's it's somewhere between what he thinks his life should be and an Adam Sandler movie. Yeah. Because he thinks That's he's Adam Sandler. No, he thinks he's Adam Sandler. Okay. And he lacks the comedic ability. Yeah. He lacks the charm. He lacks the charisma. Yep. So it doesn't come across to him. And one of the things I was trying to process as I was watching the movie again is comedies can be absurd. Yeah. Comedies can be ridiculous and far-fetched. For some reason, like Billy Madison, I'm all in. Oh, he's going to retake school? Sure. Why not? Sounds fun. But with John starting off this movie, I'm like, ah, I fuck all these girls. I just want to have one girl who wants to have a threesome. I'm like, how is this based on any reality? The guy works as a clown for children's parties. You're not fucking any girls. No. I mean, two at a time. Also, that clown whole subplot is the most bizarre thing ever. So uh, Thomas is a actor, and yes. he's trying to get acting jobs, but on the side because he can't get any acting jobs because in the movie, his movie fantasy version of himself sucks. Yeah, in his fantasy, he wants to get a job for a commercial. Yeah. Yeah. That's like his big role that he's going to get, is being in a commercial. He's dying to do it. Actually, he he yeah. has a whole Sprint PCS commercial, so I will play this little clip, which I was very impressed with. Darla, Tom's an old college buddy of mine. You might recognize him from the Sprint PCS commercial. Yeah, I'm the guy that places a call to a monkey. Of course. <laughs> of course he places the call to a monkey. Right. That's all he can do with The famous Sprint commercial. Yeah, the, 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 it's Where so Tom's relevant, the yep. so relevant, even to this day. Sure. So the whole time that he's trying to get all of these acting jobs, he ends up being also a clown on the side for kids' parties. and uh, He's great at it, by the way. Did you notice that? He's good with adults. He's good with kids. He's just all, all, all around well-liked. Yes. Everybody great guy. loves him. Um, he actually got the job as, um, or one of his jobs as a clown 
uh, was from a lovely cameo, probably the only person that I truly recognized in this movie, which was Mark Cuban, yes. playing Seamus. Um, so Mark Cuban plays Seamus, uh, who is a father, and they um, he ends up hiring John to, or Thomas, to be a clown at his kid's birthday party. Right. Which leads Thomas to his acting role in Vito and Valerie's wedding. That was his big break. And again, this is his real life. This is what actually happened to him. That's how he met his wife. Tina and, yeah, what is it? it is. Uh, whatever it is. Whatever yeah. dinner theater yeah. bull crap that his big acting role yeah. was. But he's all excited about it. He's like, oh my gosh, really? I could be in dinner theater? But it's, it's so confusing. Did you find all of those sequences really confusing? Because I felt like for a while, I wasn't sure if Vito and Valerie's wedding was a movie or a play. Right. And so you get all these weird sequences where it's like the... You think that you might be watching a play, but all you have in the background is a laugh track, but you never actually see the audience. Right, and the other problem with it is, because I'm, I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be dinner theater. Yeah. They're doing this in front of an audience every night. That's the whole point. That's why they form relationships. Yeah. Because they're doing this every night. They go for drinks afterwards. But they have these little side conversations within the play itself that no one who's watching would be able to follow because they're not like facing the audience or anything. So it's being shot like it's a TV show. Yeah. But it's not. But it's not. Okay. Right? I mean, maybe I need to nitpick you. I, no, I was super being a little nitpicky. I had no idea what it was. Yeah. Like, I had no idea what role he had finally Well, there's, there's legit pews and things. I assume the people in the pews are also actors. Yeah. Because they're supposed to be at a wedding. Yeah. That is actually where we get introduced to his love interest in the movie for the first time, which right. is that one of the actors in the pews is actually his love interest. So yes. that is Jennifer, played by Bellamy Young. Bellamy? 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 Bellamy Young? I would, I would imagine it's Bellamy. Bellamy. Um, so Bellamy Young plays John's love interest, mm -hmm. and uh, for some reason she thinks he's hilarious. Oh, um, well, I can give you the answer to that. It's because he wrote the movie? Oh, <laughs> okay, yeah. that's, that might be the real answer. Mmm, <laughs> a Jedi you are. <laughs> you get it? It's the same guy. You get it? If a gay guy gets a Bartholomew exam, is that, I mean, is, is that foreplay? It's good for him. <laughs> <laughs> You're wasted. God, uh, speaking of one dimensional, yeah. what the fuck is her character? Yeah. All right, so on their first date, yes. he gets beat up at this club he gets her into. They go out to a diner afterwards, and she explains that she just broke up with her boyfriend because he only saw her as a sex object. <sighs> He treats me like a sex object. He, you know, never listens to anything I say. He doesn't care about what I do or how I feel. I don't think he's heard a word I said in the last two years. To which, Senator John's character says, I broke up with my girlfriend because she wouldn't let me have a threesome. And she goes, I'll do a threesome. And I'm like, how, how does that make any fucking sense? You just said you dumped the guy you were with because he saw you as a sex object. And then you're going, I'm fucking another girl with you in there. Yeah, yeah, let's I mean, go. Why not? Let's why do not? this. Yeah. It sounds great. Uh, and at any point, see, this is John probably needed like a writing partner, because it was just written by John Mullins. There were no other names there, right? It would have been good to get like a Phil Hartman or someone who understood how comedy works, story structure. No. Where was uh, Phil Hartman for this? Like what a terrible waste! Hi, I'm actor Troy McClure. But I think the reason why you're supposed to think that she falls in love with him is because he dances like a, a child. Oh yeah. At this exclusive club they go to. All right, can we talk about the nightclub? Yes, please. Scene? Yes, so this is like their please. first date. Because he knows the bouncer and he can get her in and they all want to go to this dance club. So he gets her in and he's, he's dancing around like an idiot. And for some reason she thinks this is fun and funny, which no girl would think that. Never. Yeah, it's a turn off in every single way. It's just being like a goofball. But did you see how people were direct? First off, okay, the set is garbage. Doesn't look like a club in any single way. Every single set in this entire movie is curtains, is curtains in the same room. Yes, correct. Yeah, Mark Cuban happens to live in the exact same place <laughs> where the bar is, where the restaurant is, where the nightclub is. It's truly incredible. It's a very small town. Yeah, there. right. So the the way that people are dressed and the love interest in this movie is dressed like she's about to go to bed. She's just got like this, this <laughs> shitty top on with uh, spaghetti straps. It, it doesn't look like something that... Remember when we were in New York? Yeah. We were in New York for Who Are These Podcasts Live? And we were staying at a hotel that had this club up on the roof. Yeah. And we were watching the people go through that line to go to that club. <laughs> These people are dressed to fucking go clubbing. Yeah. That's what people look like when they go to an exclusive club. You have to wait. For... 
with a bouncer to get into. None of the people in this place are dressed like that. No. It didn't look anything close to what this should be. I feel like, so one of the things that I've heard, and I haven't actually watched it, but I know it's something you're looking forward to, I've heard that in the commentary track, basically John just spends half of the time insulting all of the extras. <sighs> Um, so I, I assume it's their fault. Right. I assume that so, at some point on the commentary track, there is going to be a fair amount of making fun of the extras for not dressing properly for a club. He's day. not dressed properly. She's not dressed <laughs> properly. The only person dressed properly in there is the guy who beats John up, which is my hero. Yeah. In this movie, uh, and he comes guy. back later. I know. Beats him up again. I know. It's great. It, it turns out actually, so the character who uh, beats John up during the club scene turns out to be the father of the stutterer. So right. that's how he comes back. So let's take a little peek at the stuttering scene. Want some peanut stutter monkey? Here you go. My mom says you guys are just, just jealous. It's not even how stuttering works. The line never works. I know. Yes, stutter face, we're all jealous. We all want to be stuttering idiots. Hey kid, come here. Who are you? Who am I? You gonna tell him, Joey, or should I? I'm a warlock, a male witch. Also, I just feel like if I was going to want to be something that's like terrifying to bullies, warlock is not the thing that I would have chosen. I didn't know what a warlock is, I'll be honest with uh, you. It's a male witch. Oh, okay. Yeah. And if you ever pick on Joey again, next time you're trying to go to sleep, I'll be in your room watching you. In the corner, in the closet, under the bed. It looks more like Goldilocks and than a warlock. And you finally do get to sleep, this scene also like goes on way too long. You might not even wake up. Come on, we, we don't believe in warlocks. Oh, you don't believe in warlocks? You? No. No? Well, watch this. You see the guy over there? I feel like they would have beat him up and stolen his money by now. By, oh, 100%. Those kids are way more badass than yeah. that. <laughs> Is that what witches do? I think that's what Darth Vader does. Right? It's like using the force out. It doesn't even make sense. Yes. This is another example of how John really wrote this movie to be his fantasy life of himself. He wishes that somebody would have come to his rescue in the same way that he comes to this kid's rescue. He also wishes he was picked out because he stuttered. Yeah. That's not the only reason. <laughs> and this is such a lame interpretation of how kids bully a kid. It's not even close to reality. Yeah. And then John's, how, the way he swoops in as the hero and saves the day is also so nonsensical. It's poor, complete poor nonsense. All right, so here's one of my big problems with the movie. I'm sorry if I'm cutting ahead. No, go for it. So stuttering John Melendez makes it a point to defend a stuttering kid. And that's like one of his big things in life is like, you don't make fun of people who stutter. But then his best buddy hooks up with a girl who has, who's cross-eyed and he just fucking goofs on her to her face. For being cross-eyed. So you can't make fun of people for stuttering, but anything else they have going on with fair them. Game. Fair game. Fair totally game. Totally fine. Fair game. Makes sense. So I also thought that that scene was interesting because uh. one of the things that I thought was really interesting, so when he first, when he first meets um, Jennifer, his love interest, yes, he has a little bit of difficulty. So let's take a peek at that scene. Right. By the way, I play guitar. What happens to him here has never happened to me once. And now we have, damn. Oh. So the whole reason yeah. that he can't Hi. see his love interest is because the guitar string snaps in his face. Hi. I hear you went to NYU. I guess. Uh, also, yeah. he can still see her. Did so it did get I. him in the like, eyeball? He's oh, still, look. Okay. So he, like it goes in um, and out of focus. So why does so he think stupid. that she's not attractive? Nice meeting you. So then going into that, so we know that the entire reason, we couldn't have come up with a better plot reason for him to not be able to see her. But after that, right. after he has this eyeball sequence, yes. we then go into exactly what you were talking about, which is him mocking this girl for not being able to see and having yes. cross eyes. <laughs> right. Nice to meet you. What do you think? Ah, she's a tomato, huh? Yeah, she's great. What happened to her eyes? Umbrella accident. We have both a guitar string accident and right. an umbrella accident. Wow. What is his focus with eyeballs? Yeah, is, is anyone's eyeballs safe in this movie? No. I'm not even sure. So let's talk a little bit, since we've now introduced Jeffrey Ross, let's talk a little bit about Jeffrey Ross and his character, Ernie. What I like about Jeff Ross' best buddy character here is that he's not one-dimensional. <laughs> no, he's not even one-dimensional. He's not dimensional at all. 
one of the worst scenes in this movie, because you have to realize that his buddy's like such a jerk off, is that they're at the gym. They go to the gym together. But what's Jeff Ross's character's name? I don't even know. Uh, Ernie. Ernie. Thank you. Ernie, I should know that from that stupid Jewish dating <laughs> scene. <laughs> so Ernie's at the gym standing on a treadmill. <laughs> but hold on, it gets even better. He's drinking a beer. <laughs> He's drinking a beer at the gym. Who does that? It's hilarious, Ernie guys. Does that. Ernie. God, Ernie, you're such a card. You're silly, Ernie. Oh, uh, you're not gonna pick up girls doing that, Ernie. I was actually just gonna say that I one of the things that I really disliked about his character is that he's effectively the same character as Thomas. So basically, they're both the same guy. They're the same guy. But I just realized as I was about to say that they are kind of different because. John portrays himself as trying to improve himself. Sure. I'm at the gym, I'm working out, I'm not drinking a beer. Oh yeah, and when and they go Ernie jogging, is. Ernie collapses and he's going, come yeah. on, let's go. Yeah, so you know that that part- He's was, a better version yeah. of his asshole body. That part was actually written for Artie Lang. Yes. Um, which would have made a lot more sense. Oh, Artie, I don't think would have taken that role. Uh, he did. Yeah. And then he went into rehab. I was going to say, he must have been on a lot yeah, of drugs. He went into rehab. He said yes to that. Yeah, so the whole reason that he didn't end up uh, being Ernie is because he ended up in rehab. But I feel like John was trying really hard to cast somebody who was I think, fatter. hold on a second, I have a, I have a theory on this. Because I don't think Artie likes to go to rehab. I think he's like, you know, I'd love to do your movie with you, John. I read the script, it's, it's dynamite. But, doing this heroin thing, <laughs> so I'm in a lot of control. I think I should, I probably should get help, right, John? John's going, no, you got it under control. No, I think I should probably go to rehab. How long are you shooting for? Well, we're doing a few weeks. Oh yeah, I'm gonna be in rehab for that whole a time. few weeks. That's how long it takes to yeah, kick heroin. Poor a stupid A few Artie. weeks. Now, would Artie have been funnier in this role? It's hard to say. This is obviously not playing to Jeff Ross's strengths. The only time Jeff Ross has a funny line, I'm sure he, he wrote it himself or ad libbed it when he was making fun of all the old Jewish people. No offense. All You're of not the that old. Is taken. <laughs> Um, but that was like the one time that he had like some good burns yeah, going on, yeah. some roast jokes. Yeah. Other than that, his character is just nothing. Yeah. It might as well, John Miles will be talking to an imaginary friend. The story's not great. No, it's it not. It doesn't make a lot no, of sense. No, it does not make any sense. It, it takes some quick, quick leaps from time to time and you go, wait, that doesn't make any sense. Like, yeah. all right, well, now we're here. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Yeah, so John, in addition to starring and writing and, and producing, mm -hmm. one of the other things that he wonderfully does in this movie is write all the music. He has credit oh, yeah. for writing every song. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every song. Well, why, why wouldn't you when you're a talent like him? He's a dynamo. It's amazing, truly. Yeah, the music is fantastic. So one of my favorite scenes when it comes to that is him talking about how he wants to sing while his song is playing in the background. Oh, I'm such an idiot. <laughs> hey, Darla. Hey. Hey, when's your album coming out? Oh, I don't know. A couple months, I guess. <sighs> So exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I love that last song you did. Oh, thank you. I think I can sing the chorus of it. No, no. no. <laughs> I always thought I was a good singer. So he always thought he was a good singer while his song is literally playing in the background. Yeah, well, he wants to be self deprecating, but at the same time, show everyone how fantastic he is. How great he is. He is. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't work that way. That's one of the dichotomies of Cedric John Melendez yeah. is that when he does want to be in on the joke, he does it wrong. Yeah. I promise, no more singing. Okay, so one of the other songwriters who gets all the other credit for songwriting and who performs all the songs that are sang, sang by female vocalists is Sarah Beth Tuek. Um, and Sarah Beth actually has an incredibly other prestigious credit in this movie. Really? Yes, yes. She is Mr. Melendez's personal stylist. Oh! Um, which she is actually listed in the credits for. So he had to hire somebody who both did songwriting and could be his stylist. So we can blame her for like almost everything. I wish I knew somebody like that. I know. Oh wait, I do actually. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, a stylist and a singer, huh? Mm. Wow, what are the chances of yeah, that combination? Yeah. But it's funny that you mentioned Jenny Jingles because yes. I actually thought of Jenny Jingles a whole bunch when I was watching this movie, because that's the meanest thing you've ever <laughs> I said. I know. I know. I'm really sorry. I won't sorry tell her you said that. The reason that I was thinking of her actually is because. Uh, Bellamy Young's character is named Jennifer. Yes. And she also has the most gigantic chin dimple of all time. Mm, yeah, okay. And, and one of Jenny Jingles, one of the, my favorite things that she ever said to me was that in one of the drawings for the Detroit live show that you did, the live podcast that you yeah. did there, she actually pointed out that the animation has her chin dimple. So I was thinking of Jenny Jingles. I think that one. was the great Troy Smith yeah. who uh, did that illustration oh, for yeah. us. Oh, yeah. It's for a Detroit. beautiful one. It is. It's nice. It's the most accurate, I would say. Sure. Is that the Simpsons one? 
Yeah. You, you don't even know. No, I, that is the one I was thinking of. I just wanted to make sure we're on the same page. Yeah, your wife has a chin dimple. I don't know if I'd call that accurate, but okay. It, she has a chin dimple. It's horrible. Right. Yeah. I love it. Fair enough. Yeah. I look like one of Cletus's kids in that. I know, that's why oh, it's so sir. accurate. Yeah. I look like the guy who's hanging out of the treehouse. It's like, no homers club. He's like, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that homer here? Uh -huh. No homers. <laughs> but I digress. You do. You might notice that Carl and I are in different shirts. I just had to go get changed. I was an important thing to I do. I do that mid, multiple times a day. Mid-production. Yes, I have a lot of hooded sweatshirts that I need to wear yeah. throughout I, the day. I actually took all my tech tips from you, yes. which is why I managed to fuck up the video for this. So uh, here we are again. Yeah, I'm not known for my Carl. tech or video. No. That's for sure. Never. Uh, so Carl got to come back and talk about one too many yet another time. Can we talk about their dating montage? Yes, please. Okay. So after they go on their first date, we have to speed things up and show that they are very much in love with each other and getting along with each other and having these fun, flirty adventures, making out in public way too much. I don't know who's making out in public all this, but at a certain point, this is this had me rolling on the floor. I had to pause it, rewind it. They're fighting over the TV remote. And then like he puts on the channel he wants to watch, and then she grabs it and changes it, and then he grabs it and changes it back. Cause you know, like couples, they want to watch different TV shows. It's very relatable. It's so relatable. I was just like, oh my gosh, this is like <laughs> me last night. Wow, it's so funny. Great job. It's pretty good. He understands the world. Yeah, it's pretty good. There's a lot of parts in that montage that have just like had me rolling. I'm like, wow, it really relates to my everyday life. It's as if he wrote this movie as a person who has never had any social interactions, but like has watched them and wants to understand. Understand them really this well. movie should be called Trope the Movie. Yeah. Because it's literally like everything that's already been done a million times, but done way worse in every single way. <laughs> there was nothing original about this movie Ever. whatsoever. No. Um, so something that I wanted to talk about within the montage sequence where they're going on their first date is how disgusting John makes himself as a character, even though he's literally the writer of this movie. Right. So I have a couple of clips here oh, to show Jesus. you Great. of John just being generally disgusted. Great. So this is their first date. And we get to see John drooling everywhere. Why is he drooling? Why would you put that in the movie? I don't know. So then the next time that we get to see just something completely disgusting is that John is actually about to have sex. Oh, a oh stop! Stop right there! Yeah, I know. He's trying really hard anyway. Yeah. Um, and so they're finally all in bed together after some hilarity ensues. And John has just made himself this disgusting, disgusting sweaty mess. Why would you leave that in? And the best. Oh, I, oh, I can answer that. Because every other shot looked even worse than that. <laughs> that was the best shot they that had. Was the that was probably the first one they took. You probably got way sweatier after that. So that was what I was going to say. Is The best thing about this is I feel like these clips are not even like... It's just what he looks like. Yes, yeah. you can't help that. You, yeah, yeah it, right. We're not getting something fake here. Right. I mean, they're not using CGI. No. You know, this isn't a James Cameron no, production. No. So the next one that we get is at the end of the movie, actually, we get this extremely weird Ugh. nose drip. So he is trying to reconcile with his girlfriend Jennifer, who has left him at this yeah. point in the movie, and. He just leaves this nose drip over his clown makeup, which is just completely absurd. And then the final clip of John being disgusting, I mean, let's be honest, there were many. Yeah. This is the only one that's actually fake, so this is clearly added in. And this is in yeah. the infamous poop scene, and we get to see this very fake, sweaty drip coming down the side of his forehead. But other than that, all of them seem entirely natural. And the reason that I feel like especially that ma massage scene is a totally natural John drool drip is because of this lovely clip that you wonderfully got for me. Yeah. With him drooling in real life. This is what John does. This is his podcast. You're a bunch of cheating scumbags. And Reddick, you fucking asshole. Now he's going, oh, we'll prove everybody wrong. We're just going to win. Yeah, what happened in 2007, 2017 against the Yankees? You couldn't beat them in Yankee Stadium once. Not once. Ugh. Oh, my God. It never gets easier to watch. So yeah, that's real life. I've never had that much saliva in my mouth before, <laughs> let alone have that much fall out of my mouth while ranting about something. What, why is he so wet? He's very He's wet. He's such a wet, gross man. He's very <laughs> wet and gross. And speaking of him being wet and gross, we do have to talk about the poop sequence. Yes. Um, and we're gonna watch all one full minute of him farting now. Okay, I have 
a lot of problems with this scene. Tell me. But one specifically that really stands out to me that bugs the shit out of me. Should we watch it first? No, tell me. Okay. So John has an emergency. They flash back to him eating a hot dog. Oh, not, what was I thinking? Now I got a shit. So he runs into some building, runs into a, a public bathroom. That happens to be the ladies room. He didn't realize that. He's in the handicap stall. A woman in a wheelchair comes in and starts ramming her wheelchair into the stall door saying, come on, I got a shit. This is so stupid. <laughs> it's so stupid. Kaylee. <laughs> It's, it's supposed to add to this, like, what are we, what's he gonna do? There's no toilet paper, this woman needs to get into shit. What's he gonna do? This would never ever happen. Never. And it's not even fun in a comedy setting. You're just like, what is what is this? This is like a child would write this. It's as if he was trying to test out doing stand-up comic bits. Interesting. Uh, it's like as if he's like, you know, in like a shitty club and he's like on like doing stand-up comedy yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and failing at them, but then he put it into a movie. Yeah. And it they like, just made left, the final he just left it in, yeah. yeah. All right, so we're gonna watch this, aren't you? Let, oh yeah, we're gonna watch one full minute of John farting on a toilet. And when we come back, I won't be here. <laughs> Something interesting about that scene is that actually they had a whole fart coordinator for that. El Guapo is credited for being the fart coordinator, presumably for that scene. El Guapo was so good in Three Amigos. I know. And, does and then that. downhill from there. It's too bad. Yeah. I hate to see a, a young budding career go <laughs> south like that. It's too bad. Here's an interesting fact. Do you know who this is? Uh, yes, it's uh, Getty Lee from Rush. Yes, it is. That's wow. accurate. And you can How did you, get, how did you get Getty Lee from Rush to be in your movie? That's amazing. So that's actually Bonnie Adams. Who's Bonnie Adams? Bonnie Adams is the creepy hobo in Mulholland Drive. Yeah. All right, whatever. <laughs> Very exciting. And yeah. whoever, she's also in The Nun, which came out relatively. I'm sure she's also an extra in a lot of movies. A long oh. time. God, for... it goes on. It goes on longer than that. That's, that, that's just the minute. shitting part. Yeah. But then there's no toilet paper, and so he pulls out the money just took out of the ATM, which he had to hail a cab. They're in some weird part of New York City that has no ATMs. And no cab drivers. Yeah. I've never been to this part of New York. I've been to a lot of parts of New York. <laughs> Most of them have lots of ATMs and lots of cabs, but where they are, none. Yeah, John cannot find either thing. So he finally gets the money out, the cab leaves, he's got to poop. Immediately after doing this, he crawls underneath all the stuff. So he's not worried about crawling around on the floor in this place, which is disgusting, of course. <laughs> Why would he just crawl to the next stall over to grab toilet paper and let that handicapped woman in? The setup for the scene is that he and Jennifer have decided that in order to find somebody for their threesome, yeah. they are going to hire a prostitute. And this is where we get introduced to Sandy Korn, who plays the prostitute. And she's also one of the only faces that I really recognize from the Howard Stern show. Right. She was a regular on there. Um, but you'd think John would have made more friends over the years. There's literally nobody from yeah, Howard Stern. It's shocking. Or the Tonight Show. He's or only four anything. years removed from the Howard Stern show, <laughs> yeah. and nobody wants anything to do with this. No. When they're trying to screw the prostitute in the threesome, yes. they get a hotel room. Yes. The hotel room has a twin bed for some reason. Why is that? Uh, because they could only afford one bed and they use it in multiple scenes. Is that why? With different dresses. Because my theory was the room was so small, the camera <laughs> shot would not be able to get in a king size bed and they had to get a small, but you might be right about that. It might've been a budget thing. I feel like I saw at least in one scene, there, it might actually be in that same sequence. There's a scene where they have a sink and I swear to God, I can see like the sticker for the sink. Like they went and bought a sink okay, yeah, and then yeah, they yeah. were planning on immediately returning it. So they probably bought <laughs> one bed, yes, which right. then they reuse for multiple sequences. Okay, that makes That's sense. That's my guess. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, so Jim J. Bullock is in this movie as yeah. well. Um, he plays a therapist. He plays Thomas's therapist, which is completely nonsensical to me because why in the hell would Thomas go to a therapist? He also doesn't behave in any of the ways that a therapist actually behaves in. I don't think that Suttering John knows anything about therapy, yeah. obviously. That story checks. Because literally, he's on the couch going, I, I really just want to get a threesome going. And Jim J. Bullock's character is giving him all this advice, which is, I don't think what therapists do. No. Like in every scene, he keeps giving him all this advice that's very generic. You know, Thomas, 
you realize you ask a lot of her. I mean, this threesome stuff is pretty tricky stuff. Thanks, Dr. fucking Phil. How can he afford a therapist? Doesn't he, isn't he a clown at children's parties? I mean, he's rich, obviously. He did do he that one. his own character. Well, he did do that one commercial with the monkey. Sprint PCS. The monkey commercial. So he's got a few bucks yeah, there. Yeah, he's got, he's got money coming. All right, the ass. good yeah. point. So Jim J. Bullock's character as the therapist. Yeah, pretty um, hot. Hot well, dude. Super hot. Yeah. And oddly enough, John ends up writing his character to be gay. Right. The entire movie, we do not know that he's gay. And Why would it matter? I don't know. It, it matters zero. Right. Right at the end, we get to see a scene where Jim J. Bullock's character is coming out of the next door neighbor's house. Who keeps John up at night with his sex. With his gay sex. And I have to be honest with you, I didn't realize he was having gay sex next door until no. the very end. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Turns out everything. Because he's gay. pounding on the wall going, I can't even last that long, which is like. Yeah. Well, I, we all no know shit. that. Yeah, yeah, right. That's not the thing I would have said. <laughs> but I didn't realize it was gay sex that was going yeah, on oh, yeah, next door. Now we know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah. yeah. yeah that's, I, could, it's, I could tell from it's the some noises. of the gayest sex that's ever been sexed. Jesus Christ, Ken, what are you doing? Sorry, I need movie times. Have you ever heard a movie phone? Oh, God. Oh. What was that? Nothing. Ken's on a sexual rampage again. I should go gay. I get more ass that way. So Jim J. Bullock in real life is actually gay. Okay. And um, which I believe is important now in Hollywood. If you play a gay character, you better fucking be gay. Yeah. I don't know what you acting like you like sucking dick. You better really like fucking sucking dick. In 2008, that mattered less though. True. But I kind of feel like it was a little insensitive to write his character as gay, or just have the throw in that he's gay, because because well, it was a joke. His partner died from AIDS. Yeah. His partner of six years died from AIDS. And John was like, well, let's let you relive that a little bit as your character as a shitty therapist. Yeah. So you think people dying from AIDS in the gay community isn't hilarious? I mean... Is that your take on it? I feel like not really Yeah, hilarious. I know. I'm with you yeah. on that, yeah. too. Okay, right. good. I'm glad that we're on the same page. Yeah. I was a little scared for a moment. I could tell. That's yeah. why I wanted to let you know. No, I'm totally also not funny. Also sad. Not even close yeah. to funny. Okay, right. Close. Okay, so like I said, Bullock's character is actually a therapist. And you can see here that he is reading and looking at law books. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> Whatever props we had laid around, just and throw them up on the shelf. The weirdest part about that shot is that like, they take the time to focus the camera on the law book. Good catch. Like, I didn't even notice that. But why? Like, it, none of it, it's all complete nonsense. The other time in the movie where yeah. they focus and the camera really lingers on an object where you think, oh, this must have relevance to the yeah. film, is right at the end, there's actually a sequence where there is a lingering on this movie, King of Hearts, which is a movie that came out in 1966 okay. and has absolutely nothing to do with One Too Many. I have no idea why the camera lingers on it for so long. It stays um, for an absurd time. All I can time. figure is, and I, I'm basing this on the fact that when Stuttering John was talking to a movie critic, and I'm blanking out his name, very well-known movie critic, he was explaining to this guy that in Pulp Fiction, that Tarantino placed the game of life and what was the other game? In the scene where they're reviving um, the chick I'm getting all of this wrong. That's fine. You know that he was going for something yeah. there. Yeah, he's trying. Yeah. You, you know he's like, he's like, oh, this is going to be great. They'll be breaking this down in film studies school. Yeah. They'll be trying to figure out what the symbolism is here and why I put this in there's, here. Yeah. But there's literally none. I cannot come up with a single connection. No. And then, to make matters worse, after that, I think this is where we're going to. Yeah, I apologize go for, ahead. if I'm getting ahead yeah. of you. The very end of the movie, his real life wife at that time comes to his door and then John and his wife are going out on a date, and he says, I guess the moral of the story is, if you love what you got, and you got what you love, don't fuck it up. And then, ironically, he lost his wife and his family not long after shooting that part yeah. of the movie. So, as you were just saying, his real-life wife, Susanna, yes. who, uh, she she comes in and she has a role as, she's a casting agent, she's actually, terrible. in the movie. She's really, really She's awful. so bad in this movie. Yeah, so she comes back in at the end of the film, and she, um, and he realizes, he has this big realization 
that he wants to, you know, love what he loves. And so... I like, think his realization was he shouldn't have fucked up with a girlfriend. Yeah. Because that girl, in real life, is way out of his league. Yeah. And if that, if this guy, this, this clown guy, was really banging that girl... Yeah. He probably should have treated her better. Yeah, maybe. But instead he's like, ah, oh, no, I'll, I'll fuck this piece of ass. Yeah. Um, he also does, like, a couple of weird things, too, where he's just, like... He's talking about how all he wants to do is have a threesome, but then he says things like this. Come on, Jen, you're the only one for me. I love you. You're the only one for me? Literally the entire plot of the movie is that she's not the only one. Guys lie to girls oh. all the time. Oh. <laughs> I know. Whoa. <laughs> that was the realistic part of the movie. This is why he lied life. to his girlfriend to get what he wanted. This is why my life is so confusing. Yeah, right? You're like, wait a second. I had no idea. So you just changed their mind all those times? Nope. They were lying. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So again, oh. his, his entire goal is that he wants to be able to have a threesome. Right. So nothing else should matter to him. Because he's a poon hound. He loves the poon. Yeah, well, how does he describe himself at the beginning? Oh my god. He uses all these different adjectives. Yeah. I'm just like, ugh. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Do you remember House of Poon on another note? I do, yeah. yeah. I missed that place. It was pretty good. Yeah, it burned down. Mm. I'm pretty sure for insurance money. How's the poon? It was delicious. No, but did the poon survive? I don't know. <laughs> oh, not the poon! <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, this town sucks now. Yeah, I know. We really lost out on our best. We used to have a restaurant called House of Poon, which I guess translates very differently in China. And uh, the Don and Mike show out of Washington, D.C., got wind of it and called the place because oh. they were so fascinated by it. I'm a, I like radio. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like talk radio, whoops. One of the scenes that I really hated in this movie was the scene where John's character is auditioning for a commercial because his ultimate goal is to become a commercial actor, I guess. I suppose. Um, and so, Doesn't have a lot of career ambitions in this one, I gotta be honest. Well, in real life. Again, either. it's like real life. Yeah. He ends up going for an audition and that results in this very awkward scene. Hi, guys. Thomas, this is Miranda, and this is Benjamin. Benjamin. Sorry. Hey, Benjamin. Benjamin. Oh, sorry. How are you? I want you to just slate your name for the camera, OK, and just begin. All right. Hey, look, there are two ways I could go with this. You know, is it OK if I tried them both? I am sure that both of your choices are gonna be just so great, but really we have a lot of people to run, so just do your favorite. Thomas, just go with your gut. I loved your cell phone commercial. Yeah, upstaged by a monkey. Okay, can we get started, please? Thank you. So Ben Hamin is played by Malin Riviera, and I Googled pretty much every single character in this film because mm -hmm. I was curious who the fuck all these people are, because I don't recognize any of them. Did Google know? Uh yeah, Google I'm did. Surprised. Know. Google figured out who he was. Turns out the thing that he's known for is a deep and resonant voice, which is exactly the opposite of what I would describe this scene reflected. So I'm surprised he wasn't wearing a mask too to make sure yeah, no one knew he yeah, was in this yeah. movie. He really did not want people to realize that that was him. Yeah, That's what smart. I'm figuring, yeah. However, uh, what I also found out about him was that really tragically, a couple of years before this movie was filmed, he actually lost four family members in a car crash. And I think we can all agree that still this movie is the most tragic thing to happen. To oh. Kaylee, what do you think was the worst scene in this movie? Because I was trying to narrow it down. It's hard to pick a worst. I have my top three. But what did you think was the worst? The worst? I mean, there's so many. Yeah. There's so many. Yeah, a lot of the scenes are just kind of nothing. Yeah. But then the bad scenes are bad. So, for example, I think one that stands out is obviously the poop scene. That... Goes on way too long. Well, it goes on way too long. It's not funny. The fart noises are over the top. It's just... I don't know why he thought that was going to be this hilarious moment. It's, it's so juvenile. So another scene, obviously, that's terrible is when he's in the convertible and he's got the angel and the devil. And they're talking about, like, what's he going to do about Jennifer? And the devil says things a little bit out of character for Satan. What are you, fucking nuts? Why are you whining? Who the hell are you? I'm your better half. Think of all the new <laughs> you can get now. Thomas, go back to her. She loves you. You love her. Forget her. You fucked her already. Move on. Thomas, think clearly. Follow your heart. Go back to her. Don't listen to this. 
wouldn't know a good piece of ass if it sat on his face. His idea of a good time is playing that fucking annoying harp all day. And by the way, he's a horrible fucking harp player. God had to buy earplugs. Ooh, that smarts. You know, a little homophobic. A little? Yeah. I actually, because I watch South Park, I happen to know for a fact that Satan's actually way gay. Do you always think about sex? I'm talking about very important stuff here. So gay. Yeah, he's, he's way gayest. He's way into that stuff. Yeah. So he would never call somebody a, a sea soccer. No. He'd be like, that's cool. No F words from him. Yeah, no F slurs from the devil. Nope. So that part is is really tough and cringy to get through, but... And also really bizarre because that convertible, that whole convertible scene, first of all, why... Would you have a convertible in New York City? Yeah. And why didn't he use it in order to go get money from the ATM when right. he needed to go get money? There's from never the any evidence that he drives a car or anything like no. that, and then all of a sudden he's got to think for a minute. He's like, I'll walk over and sit in my convertible yeah. and think about this. That would have been funny is if the owner would have ran out and be like, hey, asshole, yeah. you and your two buddies get the fuck out of my car. And, then I'd be like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> and it's like completely stolen 100% from Shakes the Clown. Yes. Like that whole scene driving in the convertible. It's just a less fr funny version All of right. Shakes the Clown. So I'll give Gem one his credit. He goes, what's a good movie that no one's seen? I'm going to steal from that. That was a good move on his part. It's one of the best Couldn't movies. get it past Kaylee, though. No. I She's love on that top movie. of that. Love that movie. So what's the worst scene in the movie? I pointed out two of w what would be the worst scene in any other movie. <laughs> What's the worst scene in this movie? Do you have a guess at this or a thought or? You tell me. When he, John decides to get dramatic at the end, he walks in on his girlfriend sleeping with the other girl that he's also super attracted to, which by the way, I've been a guy for a while now. We're not getting upset about that. <laughs> not, not a You're million. You're not crying. Yeah, if anything, I'm like, can I hang out for a while? <laughs> Is that cool? No, that's fine. Text me about everything that happened later. <laughs> Take some Enjoy. video if you can. Yeah, right. You two get comfortable. Sorry I bothered you. Your instead, nose is dripping. Yeah, instead, John's crying. Oh my gosh, how could you sleep with someone way more beautiful than me, even though I forced you to do it in the first place? That scene sucks. Yeah. It makes me mad. He's really, he really cares about the world. But why would he think that he could do a dramatic acting scene? You know what else I don't think I pointed out yet? One of the things I hate about bad movies like this yeah. is when actors play actors. Because, so they're already not great actors to begin with, but now they're being thrust into a scene where, okay, you have to be, act like you're acting in this dinner theater thing. And so the actors have to act even worse than how they normally act, and it's uncomfortable. I would say that John's performance in both the actor position and the non-actor position, almost exactly the same. Holy shit, you're right. The only character that doesn't change. Because everyone else has to be over the top like, Hey, now I'm acting. Look at me over here. But John's just like always just terrible. <laughs> just that one level of terrible acting. I guess if we can give him a compliment, it's that he is consistent. Yeah, he's consistently bad. Yeah. It's great almost. That should be the name of his next book. Consistently <laughs> bad. I'll write it. <laughs> You're committing yourself to a lot. I'm in. The thing that made me most uncomfortable about this movie... Mm -hmm is that there are a couple of times where I felt like John kind of looked like David Duchovny. Hmm. And that made me feel really uncomfortable because I'm not unattracted to David I was gonna Duchovny. say, you probably had a crush on him. Yeah, it's, I'm terrified. Yeah. It was like really, really, really uncomfortable for me that hmm. I was like not repulsed by John. All right, let's get rich of the ratings. How many soaked panties do you give this movie? Uh, at least five soaked Whoa, panties. Whoa, that's a pretty good rating. Uh, <laughs> only because I was thinking about David Duchovny the whole well, time. Still. And the one pair of boobs that I got to see. Right. Yeah, yeah a lot of sex with shirts out of this movie. <laughs> I, I can't talk about it enough. Not cool. Yeah. Are you okay with having this guy bounce up and down on top of you on a camera? No. How about you can keep your shirt on? Maybe. Can I put on an extra shirt? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Can you put a condom over his head <laughs> until he suffocates? Um, <laughs> especially if he's sweating and dripping from the nose <laughs> yeah, no and drooling. Yeah. And... All right, so yes. what would you rate this movie? Well, you like to do out of seven thumbs, Seven right? thumbs up. Where'd you go up with that? That's a Simpsons reference. This gets my lowest rating ever. Seven thumbs up. So I'd give this movie all seven thumbs up an asshole. Uh, John's asshole. A single asshole. <laughs> Not like a thumb up this asshole, a thumb up this asshole. All seven thumbs. Have you ever seen movies where you can get three penises into one hole? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's not easy. 
Take some ingenuity. I would, I would rather watch those movies than this movie. What are you doing right now? Oh, I think we'll stop filming and, Sounds good. and go watch the movies. Well, first, tell us what you would rate this film. I would, I, I, you can't give something a zero thumbs because that's not how Amazon works. That's why I gave it negative. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and give it one thumb up. It was complete garbage, but still not as bad as Waterworld or Wedding Crashers. I know. Not as bad as Wedding Crashers. I know. You hate me. Someone lost all credibility just now. I Whoops. know. It's true. It's true. It's true. I hate that movie. Fuck Vince Vaughn. Fuck Vince Vaughn? Nice talking to the internet. I gotta go. <laughs> I just want to say thank you again so much, Carl, for being here. I would not have wanted to suffer through this with anybody other than you. Do I get paid now or um, should yes. I send you an invoice? How's you are going to get paid in the poop money that John used mm. to wipe his butthole with. Fuck. Well, a 20 is a 20. You can grab it out with your thumbs. <laughs> yeah, all seven thumbs. Um, so I would love it if you told everybody one more time all about what you do and where people can go and view your stuff. I am the host of Who Are These Podcasts. You can go to whoarethese.com. That's where you'll find all of our episodes or wherever you get podcasts. We also have a YouTube channel at Who Are These Podcasts. And uh, or actually, I think our YouTube is Carl WATP now. Because they gave it, they let you do oh, yeah, an, an yeah. at symbol yeah, now. That's great for your YouTube. But either way, you'll find us on YouTube and all I'll our fun videos. It. I'll link it in the Thank description you. I, box I'd below as well. I'd appreciate that. Yeah. And uh, if you like goofing on stuttering John, then you will enjoy Who Are These Podcasts. We do it quite a bit. Yeah.